and I'm going live on YouTube now. Oh yeah, that's a billion dollar shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Very shiny. Nice. We got the uh, we got the future of technology. And funny enough, under this shirt, I have the past of technology, but I don't know if anyone recognizes this logo or not. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, I I've seen it, but I don't remember what it is. <laughs> well, we are it's at the, the old top Amiga of the computer. <laughs> So we're at the top of the hour, and so I'm going to go ahead and get started here. And so hello, everyone, and welcome to the March NASA Night Sky Network member webinar. We're hosting tonight's webinar from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco, California. However, we are distributed around the country in various places. We're very excited to present this webinar with our guest speaker, Dr. Kelly Lipo from the Space Telescope Science Institute. And so she's in Maryland, Dave's in way far um, New York, almost to Canada, and I am in San Francisco. So welcome to everyone joining us on the YouTube live stream. We're very happy to have you with us. These webinars are monthly events for members of the NASA Night Sky Network, though we look forward to continuing to see you on YouTube. For more information about the NASA Night Sky Network and the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, check the links in the chat, which I'm going to put in there right now, so that you can, let's see, it didn't do it. So maybe Dave, you could. Uh... Well, I also got some news for everyone too. Oh yeah, Astronomical Society of the Pacific and Night Sky Network links coming up. Bam. All right. There we go. And shall I do news real quick? Yep. All There's right. Dave with a few announcements. All righty. Um, I uh, just want to let folks know that uh, the deadline for the pin orders, it ends in the end of this month, not a week. Um, but after that, I ship out the three free pins that uh, clubs are already getting. So uh, those are for clubs that have not yet placed their orders, but who still qualified for free pins by posting a two or more uh, event reports for their events for last year. Um, so this is a lighter ship time than usual because um, we were letting clubs extending the order period. Uh, so if you're wondering what was up with the pins and why haven't I gotten my pins yet, that, that's why you're getting them. Don't worry. And I actually have three pending orders. I've got to ship and I'll do that tomorrow. Uh, we're hoping to have uh, everything shipped by mid-April. And just uh, before that, um, in the next week, if you can, uh, make sure your club shipping and contact information is up to date by going to the Night Sky Network website and clicking on the Edit Club Setup button and just scrolling on down that first page, make sure everything is up to date. Once in a while, we you know move around or things need to get updated. And if you need information on the pins and qualifications and all that, it is at bit.ly slash pin order 2020. And that link is in the Zoom chat. Um, uh, and also, I just want to mention that next month is a big deal for astronomy fans and science fans as well. For April is Global Astronomy Night, Global Astronomy Month, uh, but also Citizen Science Month. And we're actually going to have a webinar on that on, I believe, April 29th and links to many more community science resources in our newsletter and website when April rolls around. And I believe our guest list is now settled, but we just kind of wrapped it up. So there'll be some solid information forthcoming. And I believe that's pretty much it for program news. And uh, yeah, back to you, Brian and Kelly. Thanks, Dave. So for those of you on Zoom, you can find the chat window and the Q&A window on the bottom edge of your Zoom window on your desktop. Please feel free to greet each other in the chat window or to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties. You can also send us an email at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org. If you have a question for our speaker, please uh, type it into the Q&A window. That will help us keep track of it and also let us know whether or not we've answered your questions or not. So again, please use that Q&A window. And again, to remind you in the chat window, go down to the bottom and select panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your greeting. So I'm gonna hit my recording here. All right, well, welcome again to the March webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Dr. Kelly Lipo to our webinar. Kelly is an education and outreach 
scientists at the Space Telescope Science Institute, where she works to support outreach efforts for the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope. She has a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of Toronto. She's made numerous local and national media appearances to talk about everything from the 2012 Mayan apocalypse to the super blue blood moon. That's hard to say. She has also served as the coordinator of the McGill Space Institute, designed undergraduate teaching labs, taught physics at Gonzaga University. Yay, Spokane. I went to Whitworth in Spokane, and so I know it well. I took my GRE at Gonzaga in one of their nice little rooms once upon a time, too. And she has also helped build the Large Hadron Collider at CERN and has some stories about climbing around the instruments and uh, um, trying not to get all the grit and grime all over the students in the elevator. So you can perhaps ask her that at some point. So please welcome Dr. Kelly Lipo. So thank you very much. I'm just gonna start sharing my screen here and get my slides pulled up. There we go. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for that lovely introduction. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Kelly Lipo. I am an education and outreach scientist at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. And today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what to expect uh, from the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope. So I thought I would start with the elephant in the room, which is that there's been a lot of delays in the launch of the uh, web telescope. So here we have an XKCD web comic. Uh, on the Y axis is the planned launch date. On the X axis is the current date. And you see you can fit a nice line through that. And now it's 2021, and that is when we think we're going to launch the Webb Telescope. Randall Monroe, on the other hand, thinks that it's probably more likely in 2026. Uh, but I do have it on good authority that Webb is on track to launch in October 2021. Uh, there are very few things that need to be wrapped up with a telescope between then and now it's passed all of its tests. So now is the time to start planning for a very spooky Halloween launch party. And I would like all of you to start thinking about Halloween costumes. I would like to see all of them. Please tag me on Twitter. Um, so tonight, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the motivations for the Webb telescope. We're going to talk a little bit about infrared light and infrared astronomy. We'll talk about what cool science Webb is going to do. We'll talk about the telescope itself, what you can expect during and after launch, and how you can host your own event with NASA's help to help celebrate the launch of this telescope. So let's set by setting the scene. Why do we want to build Webb? And our story starts with another telescope that was very ambitious, but may have been a teensy bit behind schedule and over budget. Um, so scientists first thought of telescopes like Hubble in the 1940s. Hubble itself was built in the 70s and 80s, and it was launched on the Space Shuttle Discovery on April 25th, 1990. And if you would like to recreate this yourself, I just saw on Twitter, that LEGO is launching a model, uh, Space Shuttle Discovery and Hubble Space Telescope, so you can pull Hubble out of the bay of the Space Shuttle if you'd like to. April 1st, check it out. Um, so space, the Space Telescope Science Institute, where I work, was created to support Hubble in its science operations. Uh, and Hubble has left us with this legacy of the really cool astronomical images. So here we have uh, the Butterfly Nebula, the Sombrero Galaxy, the Spiral Galaxy NGC 1300, and the Ring Nebula. But I think maybe the most influential picture to ever come out of Webb 
is this one. It's one that happened when they pointed Webb at an otherwise dark patch of sky. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So I've circled the stars in this image. Of the 10,000 objects in the deep field, only about a few hundred of those objects are stars. The rest are all galaxies. And this is like super duper mind blowing. These things are very faint and very far away. And you can actually order all of these galaxies with a little bit more information through spectroscopy. You can order them between the ones that are nearest to us. And because it takes light a certain amount of time to travel, the nearest galaxies are also the ones that emitted their light more recently, all the way to the farthest galaxies. And the farthest galaxies, the light has been traveling for the longest time, so we're looking the farthest back in time. But then, really, the question is, can we go back even farther? What were the first galaxies like? And you can't do that with Hubble. So people began dreaming up a new next generation space telescope. So here we have an early concept of a next generation space telescope. And then we have what it turned into, the James Webb Space Telescope. We have a model uh, from 2005 with a team that helped build it at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. And then we have the final artist's conception of what web will look like when it's in space. So why do we need web? Why do we need this next generation telescope? Well, it's because as space expands, it stretches light. So the farther you look back in time, the redder galaxies appear. So Hubble is limited in what wavelengths of light it can observe. It can't go far enough back in time. We need a different telescope like Webb to observe the first galaxies. So here is a depiction of the electromagnetic spectrum. This is different types of light. In the middle is visible light. This is the type of light that our eyes can see. Um, on the blue side of things is ultraviolet light. So Hubble sees ultraviolet light, visible light, and a wee little bit of the infrared. The James Webb Space Telescope really excels at observing infrared light. It can actually see into like the yellow end of visible light, all the way from the near infrared to the mid infrared. So there was a thought that Webb would be replacing Hubble, but that's not true. Hubble is still going strong 30 years on. We're approaching the 31st anniversary of Hubble. So Hubble and Webb complement each other. Hubble is able to see in visible light and ultraviolet light. Webb can't. Webb is much better at seeing infrared light. So Hubble and Webb, friends in the sky, there's a very cute video on, web, on <laughs> webtelescope.org, sorry, um, that you can watch, you know, showing how Hubble and Webb are friends, like, you know, hearts, very cute. Um, but let's, why would you even want to observe in the infrared? Why does Hubble need this friend? Uh, well, partially this is because everything is glowing even if our eyes can't see it. So you and me and the computer that I'm currently talking into are all glowing in infrared light. Our eyes can't see this, it's too red. It's light that's redder than red. But you can take a selfie with an infrared camera like I did here, and you can see that my skin is very bright in infrared light. Uh, because I am warm and I'm glowing. The same with the back of my phone, that's glowing. You can see my glasses are very dark here because it's blocking the infrared light coming off of my face. So everything is glowing in infrared light. But also, as we were talking about earlier, you can use infrared light to see things that have redshifted into the infrared. So what do I mean by this? Well, here we have a galaxy. Um, it's 
very, very far away. The light has been traveling for 13.4 billion years to reach us. That's about 3% of the age of the universe when this light was emitted 400 million years after the Big Bang. So this is a very old, very far away galaxy. And the light it was giving off was actually similar to the galaxies near us. It was mostly in the visible and UV um, spectrum. But as this light has been traveling for 13.4 billion years, it got stretched. And as it got stretched, it got redder and it got so red that it's in the infrared. And so if you wanna see the earliest galaxies, if you want to see things that are very far away, you have to look in the infrared. But wait, that's not all. Um, some things are just intrinsically bright in the infrared. Like for example, me, or, um, Look at this area around the star, HR8799. You can't actually see the star itself. We've placed a black circle in front of the star because it's too bright, but we can look at the area around it and you can see these little dots that are moving around. And those dots are in fact planets. These are planets orbiting around another star. They're exoplanets. And they happen to be particularly bright in the infrared. They're glowing in infrared light. Another very important aspect of infrared light is that it allows you to see through dust and it allows you to observe dust. So here's a very famous Hubble image of the Eagle Nebula dubbed the Pillars of Creation. And when I first started at Space Telescope, I got to meet the guy who coined that name, the Pillars of Creation. And I was really geeking out as a 90s kid. Anyways, um, you can see these columns and they're dark and they're dusty and there are stars forming inside of there, but you can't really see it unless you look in the infrared. So uh, on the right, we see an infrared image of the same nebula and we can see through those pillars of dust. We can see the stars forming inside. We can see the stars behind them. If you go to even redder wavelengths in the mid infrared, what you end up seeing is glowing dust. This is cold dust that is glowing in the mid infrared. So if you want to understand the areas around forming stars, looking in the infrared is key. Another thing that you can use the infrared to study is molecules. So molecules tend to wiggle and jiggle and emit infrared light and absorb infrared light. So if you want to understand what kind of molecules like water or carbon monoxide are in either your nebula or even the atmosphere of a planet, what you can do is you can take the light, the infrared light, spread it out and look for these very characteristic dips that are produced by different kinds of molecules. Okay, so you might say, well, Kelly, that's super awesome. We should go do some infrared astronomy. The problem is infrared astronomy is actually really hard. And why is it so hard? Because everything is glowing, even if we can't see it with our own eyes. So here is an image of the city of Montreal taken with an infrared camera. You might notice that the sky is glowing. The atmosphere is warm. It glows in infrared light. And if you had a telescope on top of Mount Royal, looking over the city here, it would also be warm and therefore glowing in infrared light. I've heard infrared astronomy described as trying to observe the stars in optical wavelengths that our eyes see at noon with a telescope that is made out of light bulbs. <laughs> I like that analogy. Another one I've heard is infrared astronomy is like finding a match in a blast furnace. Your background is just so high, it's very hard to get a signal. And I assure you that I did actually Photoshop a picture of a match into this blast furnace. Can you see it? Move my mouse, Let's see, it's right there. It is hard to see the signal through all of the noise in the background. And another thing that makes infrared astronomy really hard is that the atmosphere is opaque to infrared light. So here is a chart, and I promise this will be the most difficult one in the whole talk, that shows how much light gets through the atmosphere. So dark is the light is blocked, light, the light, 
light is <laughs> the light gets through. So we can see over here in the UV, most of the light is blocked, which is good if you don't want to get sunburns. It's bad if you want to do ultraviolet astronomy. Invisible light, most of the light gets through, which makes sense. That's what our eyes see. Um, and then as you go into the infrared, you start getting these bands of light, or these bands that where light is blocked. And this is primarily due to water vapor in the atmosphere. Water molecules are really, really good at absorbing infrared light in these very specific regions. So that means that if you want to do infrared astronomy, you need to have a very cold telescope, or at least cool your detectors, so that you're not just seeing light from your telescope, you're seeing light from space. But also you need to be either in space or at the top of a cold, dry mountain where you're above as much of the atmosphere as you can be, and you have the least amount of water uh, as you can in the atmosphere. Or a third way, you can mount your telescope in an airplane and fly it around in the stratosphere. That's the Sophia telescope. It's my favorite telescope other than Webb, just because it's so awesome. So all of these things mean that Webb is not the first infrared space telescope. There have been a whole legacy. Some of them are shown here. This isn't even all infrared space telescopes. Um, you can see also that Hubble has a little bit of infrared range, but Webb down at the bottom has a huge, gigantic mirror. This is the biggest mirror we've put into space, which is really why we're so excited about this. We have a huge mirror. We have advanced instrumentation. It's going to be awesome. So on that note, let's talk about some of the science that we can do with Webb. Why I, as an astronomer, get so excited. So the Things that Webb will do, the science of Webb, include the early universe. So that's what we were talking about earlier, the very first galaxies. What do they look like? Galaxies over time, the life cycle of stars and planets, and also planets both in our solar system and around stars other than the sun. I'll dive into this a little more. So just like Hubble, Webb will take ultra deep fields to uh, detect the very first galaxies. Another thing Webb will be able to do is it'll be able to watch the universe change from something that's mostly just boring neutral hydrogen gas into something that resembles the universe today, where most of the hydrogen gas between galaxies is ionized when we have galaxies that look like the ones that we're used to. We'll also be able to trace the history of galaxies from the very first galaxies to today. We'll watch them merge and grow and form stars and black holes. And when I say watch, I don't mean individual galaxies. We will have snapshots over time and we'll sort of use this as a flip book to understand the history of galaxies by studying individual objects at different points in time. And we'll also be able to understand the birth of stars and planets around those stars. So as I said, infrared light allows us to both see dust and see through dust. And planets and stars tend to form in these dusty nebulas. And so we'll really have an exceptionally good window onto how baby stars form. And the last um, big theme in web science is understanding planets inside of our solar system. So we'll be able to see planets past Mars. So sorry, Venus and uh, Mercury, we'll get to you later, I guess. Um, Webb can't point towards the sun or you fry the telescope and then everyone gets mad at you, you know. Um, but also we'll be able to observe exoplanets. Those are planets around stars other than our sun. 
We'll be able to watch them orbit around their stars. We'll be able to look through their atmospheres and figure out what their atmospheres are made out of. It's very exciting. So how are we going to do this? We talked about the science. Now let's talk a little bit about the engineering that makes this science possible. So here's a quote from sort of the definitive document that talks about the science of the James Webb Space Telescope. Webb will be a large cold telescope with a wide field of view, exceptional angular resolution and sensitivity, and a wide wavelength coverage in both imaging and spectroscopy. So these are the instruments that are aboard uh, Webb. We have the near-infrared camera um, or near-cam. And you can see here, we have little icons. So the little prisms indicate spectra that's spreading out the light to learn about it. We have little cameras that's just taking pictures, imaging. And we also have a little image that's a coronagraph. That's similar to that star that I showed you earlier that had the planets orbiting around it where you block out the bright things so you can see dim things. Um, so we have the near infrared camera or uh, near cam. It's an imager and it also functions as a wavefront sensor to keep the 18 years functioning as one. We have the near infrared spectrograph or near spec. It's the first multi-object spectrograph in space. It can observe a hundred objects with its micro shutter array at the same time. It also has an integral field unit, which allows you to take a spectrum of each pixel of every object. And I cannot convince my non-astronomer friends that this is exciting, but trust me, it's really super cool that one of these is in space. Um, there's the mid-infrared instrument, or MIRI. It's both an imager and a spectrograph, and it covers longer and redder wavelengths than the other instruments. And then there's also the Canadian contribution, and I would be remiss if I didn't point this out. It's the fine guided sensor and near-infrared imager and slitless spectrograph, which is a mouthful. It's both a fine guidance sensor and a science instrument. It's used for pointing the telescope, but it's also really optimized to do exoplanet science. So we learned about the instruments. Um, where is Webb going to be? It's going to be at this point called L2. Webb needs to be cold, so it can't be in orbit of the Earth like Hubble. It has to go beyond the orbit of the Earth and the Moon at this point called L2, the second Lagrange point. And that's a place that balances Earth's and the Sun's gravity and allows for a more or less stable orbit. Um, but beyond sticking Webb way out there in, in its orbit, it also has two things that keep it cold. So Webb will have a hot side, which is about 185 degrees Fahrenheit, and a cold side, which is like minus 388 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's a huge temperature difference between the two sides. Part of this is done passively. So it has a sun shield that protects the telescope from sunlight and light from the earth. There's also an aspect of the telescope that has active cooling. So the MIRI instrument, the mid-infrared, the farthest red wavelength instrument, actually needs more cooling than that. So it has what amounts to a very sophisticated refrigerator or air conditioner. It's a closed system that's called a cryo cooler that keeps it very, very cold. Um, so the sun shield is pretty cool. Um, the goal of the sun shield is to deflect heat back into space and keep the cool side of the telescope cold. There's five layers to it, and the first two layers do most of the work. Um, so that's a cartoon. This is what it actually looks like. It's pretty awesome, right? It's shiny. Um, the sun shield consists of five layers of a material called Kapton, which is coated with a very, very thin layer of aluminum. And these things are very, very thin. It's like the width of a human hair. Um, and this is so that we can reflect this heat and light back into space and away from the telescope. The first two layers are also coated with this 
this doped silicone layer, um, and that's to help protect them from the UV radiation from the sun. Okay, so web is cold, but it also has to have this big mirror. And the reason that web has to have such a giant mirror is because um, as you go redder, you need a bigger mirror in order to have the same resolution. We say that the uh, resolution of your telescope is inversely proportional to the wavelengths. Um, so Webb and Hubble have a similar resolution. Webb needs a much bigger mirror. Again, this is a cartoon. This is what it looks like in real life. And not only does Webb's mirror need to be larger, it also needs to be lighter than Hubble and stable at very cool temperatures. And that's why Webb's mirrors are made out of beryllium, which is six times stronger than steel and two thirds the density of aluminum. And they're coated in a very, very thin layer of gold, about a thousand atoms thick, which is the best material for reflecting in the infrared. And the whole telescope actually has to survive launch in an Arian 5 rocket, which means that it needs to fold up. And so that's part of the design choices of Webb. That's part of why it has this segmented mirror so that it can fold up and then unfold to something that resembles a round mirror. Now, I'm gonna brag a little bit about where I work. Um, so the Space Telescope Science Institute houses um, Webb's Mission Operations Center, which gets data from the telescope. So the Webb telescope will beam down data to from the Deep Space Network that gets sent to Baltimore, Maryland, where I am, um, and commands from the Space Telescope Science Institute travel up to the telescope. Uh, so the Space Telescope Science Institute uh, oversees Webb's Mission Operations Center it's Science Operations Center, which picks like what things Webb will observe based on proposals from scientists. And it also stores all of Webb's data in MAST. And if you really feel like it, you can download all of this data yourself. It's open to everyone. Um, and Webb is a huge, giant collaboration. There are over 120 American, European, and Canadian universities across 14 countries and 29 US states it involves a whole lot of different NASA centers, the European Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, and the contractor Northrop Grumman, which actually did the oversaw the work of building the telescope itself. Okay, so now I think is why you are all here to talk about what's going to happen with web launch and deployment. So web is currently a, a Northrop Grumman Grumman facility in Rinaldo Beach, California. Later this year, it's going to go through the Panama Canal to reach French Guiana. Um, and it will launch from the European spaceport located in Karoo, French Guiana. Why it's launching from there? Um, it's beneficial to launch things from near the equator because the spin of the earth can help give you an additional push to get your rocket. Um, into space. Why use an Ariane 5 rocket? Because in the early 2000s, when we were designing Webb, it was really the only choice. It was the only launch vehicle that was big enough and reliable enough to launch Webb. Um, the European Space Agency also is using this as their contribution to Webb. And in exchange, European astronomers get a fraction of time on the telescope. So what's going to happen at launch? Uh, NASA TV, NASA TV is planning a three to four hour broadcast at launch. It will cover operations in Karoo, French Guiana, at the Mission Operations Center, at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. And it will also um, have guest viewing uh, at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Um, it'll probably be similar to previous launch broadcasts that you've seen, some of the, the Mars Perseverance um, rover, for example, and it will be coordinating with both the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency on this broadcast. Um, there are going to be very limited viewing opportunities, both at the spaceport in French Guiana, it's just 
not like the Kennedy Space Center. Um, it's not set up to have visitors. And also with COVID restrictions, um, there might be some in-person viewing parties, but they'll probably be very small. But um, later in this talk, I will tell you how you can throw your own launch parties across the country. So the web will, after it launches, it will go through a whole series of deployments as it travels from the Earth to the L2 point. What will this look like? Well, um, we'll so also I'm going to say that while we were all watching the Perseverance rover land on Mars because it had cameras everywhere and it was awesome, this is not the case for Webb. There are no cameras on Webb. I'm sorry, if I were running the web mission, there would be, but I'm not. So some engineers decided <laughs> that it wasn't worth it um, to watch the deployment. So we're going to have to rely on visualizations and data coming back from the telescope to see if all the deployments were successful. I'm sorry. Um, so let's use our imaginations to see what this would look like in space. So the Webb telescope will start off very compact because it needs to fit in this rocket. Slowly, it will unfurl its, um, its uh, <laughs> both the sun shield and um, its solar panels. That's the word I was looking for. Then later the sun shield will expand all the way. And at that point, we can deploy the secondary mirror from its uh, position where it was. So it was compacted up, folded up for launch. It's going to go down. And now we can uh, deploy the wings of the mirror. And now we have a full circle. And then we have our telescope. And it will go over to L2. And while it's there, we'll be able to do all sorts of tests to make sure that the telescope is actually working how we think it's working as it's cooling down. So uh, this is the timeline for what this is going to look like. Sometime in August of this year, um, we're going to ship the telescope to Kourou, French Guiana. After that, um, launch will happen sometime in October um, 2021. The deadline is um, the 31st, so Halloween, we're going to have a spooky web party. It might launch before that if all of the preliminary stuff that happens at the spaceport is done early. We'll see. Um, and then that means that in November, um, we'll go through all of these deployments and the telescope will arrive at L2. By January of 2022, the telescope will cool enough in order to be able to start doing science. Um, and then we'll spend a couple months aligning all of the mirrors. So there are all of these, there's 18 segmented mirrors. They all need to be perfectly aligned with each other. And there's little actuators that allow the mirrors to move a little bit. So we're gonna spend a while aligning all the mirrors, testing all the instruments, making sure everything is right. And then in May of 2022, if everything goes to plan, <laughs> we'll have our first images from web and they'll probably be really awesome and I'm looking forward to it and they will not tell you what they are it's a big secret so don't ask I don't know um so now we'll talk about how you yes you can host an event um and so I apologize for this being a little tentative I was hoping by the time I gave this talk we would have approvals on everything but we don't quite yet. So some of this stuff is TBA, um, but keep your ears out because very soon we're going to uh, put out a call for um, events to host either in-person or digital events um, around both launch and first images. This is going to be pretty similar to the um, 2017 Eclipse events that were sponsored by NASA. There's going to be a competitive process in order to uh, apply to host an event. The exact criteria are still be uh, to be announced, 
But the thinking at the moment is something like uh, museums, science centers, planetariums, public libraries, uh, visitor centers, art galleries, non-profit public institutions that are either communicating science or wish to communicate science will be eligible, but that might change a bit. Keep your eye out for this. Um, and there will be funding for US institutions. If you're not in the US or you don't quite meet the criteria, there will be other indirect supports for your events. So um, what you can receive, and again, this might be a bit tentative, but this is more set in stone. You can receive a stipend of up to $3,000 for your organization to use for the event. You'll get things like activity guides, promotions of your event on the NASA website, um, direct connections with subject matter experts. So you can have a scientist come and talk at your event, either in your local area or remotely. And I think this is a real big plus and very exciting. Um, and it's a big thing that NASA is trying to do, connect subject matter experts with uh, informal learning opportunities. So there'll be launch uh, lawn signs, um, a banner that you can hang outside of your event and folders containing things like uh, lithographs, posters, decals, fun pads, lapel pans, bookmarks, all sorts of fun things that you can hand out. So um, the announcement will come soon. It will come through uh, the informal learning networks from NASA, including things like the Night Sky Network. Um, but also if you want to, you can follow us on social media. It'll also be there. Um, so you can follow NASA web on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, um, or you can follow space telescope or space underscore telescopes on uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, that's run out of the space telescope science Institute. So you can see all the cool things that we're up to. And the website, um, webtelescope.org has all sorts of really cool stuff. All of the images that I used in this talk are all pulled through from there. There are videos, there are animations, there's guides to all of the science at many different levels, lots of different entry points for that. And with that, uh, I am done and I am happy to take all of your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. And we do have a lot of questions that are, uh, really? are here, which is uh, not a surprise because this is, uh, you know, definitely a high interest uh, mission. So let's uh, get started here. So uh, very early on, so John answer, asked this question, what is the arc second resolution of uh, JWST? Gosh. Uh, <laughs> I, I do not know that off the top of my head and it depends a bit on the wavelength. Um, sorry about that. I feel underprepared, <laughs> but well, you can, you, uh, there's lots of technical documentation that you can look that up if you'd like to. Well, you did note that it was similar to the Hubble. It is similar to Hubble. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Darian asked, uh, and this may be something that Dave could do, if uh, Dave, if you have a, a chance to pop uh, the web address for both the Hubble and that the Hubble and web anim animation that Kelly told us about, I think you did that earlier. If you could repost that, that would be great. Yeah, you can uh, find hey, it on, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's coming. Webtelescope.org. Okay. All right, I got All the right. direct link right here to on YouTube as well. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, Robert asks, uh, can the Webb Telescope show us anything about dark Oops. matter in the early universe? And uh, what about, uh, it could, can it influence the thoughts about dark energy and give us any insights into those? Yeah, so Webb is not quite the best telescope to deal with uh, dark energy. Um, the upcoming Roman Space Telescope, which is like, mid 2020s, late 2020s, depending on how things go. That is really a big survey telescope that's meant to uh, understand the large scale structure of the universe and questions about dark energy. Uh, Webb's field of view is just a little bit too narrow in order to do that. Um, however, there is an interplay between this um, 
era of reionization in the universe and the exact timing of that and models of the universe and dark matter. So there is a little bit of that. Um, and Webb will also be able to study like galaxies and clusters of galaxies, which tell us a lot about dark matter. Um, but the real early universe and dark matter is not quite Webb's specialty. All right, so again, one of those uh, things that it can complement some other- yes. instruments. Compliment friends in the sky. Oh, and I see um, 0 0.1 arc seconds. So thank you for Googling that for me so I don't have to. Yeah. Okay, so Darian asks, uh, and this, uh, I know that you alluded to this, you talked about um, how Webb is going to be able to help us understand the genesis and evolution of galaxies through time. Um, he just was uh, curious about that. And will it be able to look back to different points in time? for you know, different galaxies? And how does it go about doing that? Right, yeah. So we only get one picture of a galaxy. Galaxies don't change on like a couple year time scales that we could observe it with Webb. So um, what we look at is we look um, to further and further galaxies. So the farther your galaxy is, the longer its light has been traveling, the further back in time you're looking. So by measuring how much the light has stretched, um, and you do that by looking at the, the spectra of your galaxy and looking where the spectral lines are in that galaxy and where they are on Earth, and you can tell exactly how much the light has been stretched and therefore how far away it is and therefore how old the light is, you can really build up a history of galaxies from the first galaxies to the present day, um, but you only get one snapshot of a galaxy. So you can't say things about the history of the Andromeda galaxy, but you can say things about, this is what spiral galaxies in general have been doing over the past couple billion years. Isn't that cool? All right. Okay, we have a few here about, um, I'm guessing about the, uh, the um, the impact of the solar wind and, and the heat shield, how much will the solar wind push on the web? Yeah, so I mean, that is a concern. Um, and so L2, where it is, is kind of a stable orbit, but it's kind of only metastable. And so you have things like uh, the solar wind and small tugs from the sun and the earth and everything else in the solar system. And so Webb needs to do a little bit of station keeping. So it has a little bit of fuel on board that allows it to remain where it's supposed to be um, and at the right angle and all of that stuff. And so that is something that you have to take into account when you're designing the telescope. And that's ultimately what's going to limit the lifetime of Webb is the ability to maintain its position. Um, just like the Spitzer Space Telescope, which uh, finally went offline in uh, January, 2020, that was uh, what did it in is it was at this L2, the second Lagrange point, and it just kept getting drifting further and further away from that. And at a certain point, it was at such a wonky angle they couldn't use it anymore was sad. I liked Spitzer. Okay, also related to the heat shield. So Lee was wondering about the effectiveness of the heat shield against microparticles or dust, or is that? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, and what I understand is that small little tears through the heat shield aren't actually a big deal. Like it's very thin, um, but that's the reason why there are five layers. You can have tiny tears in like one layer and it's totally fine. Um, if you had like a big, something real big hit web, then you would be in trouble, but we, there's not really anything to hit it out there. So I've been assured by people who know more about the engineering than I do that it's totally cool. Okay, so uh, William asked uh, about the dimensions of the Webb telescope, and I know we saw that image of the uh, all the people, which kind of gives scale, uh, but the dimensions, then he also notes that it looks like one of the space destroyer ships from Star Wars, and was that thought of when they um, designed it? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't think so. Um, so the, the heat shield itself um, is described often as the size of a tennis court, um, so, you know, big, but not like Star Destroyer big. 
And then uh, Bobette asks uh, if there's a video of how the folded instrument will unfold. And that might be something that's on the uh, Hubble site. Um, or... Yeah, so it's, it's on uh, webtelescope.org. It's also on the NASA website. It's also on YouTube. Um, yeah, I really wanted to show that, but um, video doesn't work very good on Zoom. And also it's like 10 minutes long. Um, but if you have the chance, you should check it out. It's pretty cool. Okay, so uh, we have a question here. Is, is uh, Webb's launch vehicle the last Ariane 5 that is going to launch? Or is, you know, apparently that's something that... Uh, was, oh, gosh, uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, that would be uh, a send-off for a really reliable, you know, launch vehicle after all these it, years. It would be. I have no idea. I mean, I thought that was sort of a workhorse, but uh, I don't know much about the ESA's plans for it in the future. All right. Um, so Bob asked, are the individual mirrors separately controllable in order to create the proper curvature or are they fixed? They are movable, right? So they, um, they are curved a little bit in advance, um, but you can actually actuate each mirror individually. Um, and that's part of what's going to take, why it takes so long from when web launches to when it's going to send back the first pictures is just aligning all of these little mirror segments. I watched a really cool presentation from like the guy who's in charge of this. So basically they pick a star and then each one of the mirrors will make an image of that star and then they kind of line them all up and then they wiggle it around and then they do it again and they do it again and they do it again and then they do it again until it's absolutely super duper perfect. All right, so we so, have Oh. Yeah, uh, yeah. So maybe the first image that we get down from Web won't actually be some cool nebula or something. It'll be one single star just to show, hey, it works. To see whether it's in focus or not. Exactly. It better be. <laughs> well, we have a question about uh, public access to the data and images. And so, where are those going to be? Uh, the, the Hubble um, data and images are easily obtained. And so, are the web images going to be equally easy? Yes. So all of the science data is on the MAST archive, which is hosted by the Space Telescope Science Institute. So anyone can go download that data and process it from anywhere in the world for any reason. It doesn't matter. Um, the more public friendly images, like the things that you think of pretty Hubble images, take a little bit more work to like take the different filters and put them together and, you know, edit out all of the like weird cosmic rays or whatever that are, um, or weird things with a telescope, that sort of thing. Um, all of those are going to be on um, the uh, web uh, website. <laughs> um, and they're all public domain images. You can use them for whatever you want, just like Hubble. Right. So Ron asked uh, about the, the uh, with planets typically glowing in IR, um, does the presence or absence of atmospheres influence that? Yes. Um, so the, the presence of an atmosphere tends to keep a planet warmer for longer. Um, so if you just have a rock in space, it will tend to cool over time. And the colder something is, the less it will glow in the infrared. Um, an atmosphere acts like a warm blanket. Um, it traps heat. And also the greenhouse effect um, is a thing that atmospheres do, both on like Earth and also Venus. Um, and so that also keeps your planet warm. So the presence or absence of an atmosphere influences its infrared light. Um, you can also use web to watch starlight shine through the atmosphere and figure out if there is an atmosphere and if there is, what is it made out of? Um, and so that's some really exciting science that you can do kind of a little bit with Hubble, but you'll be able to do really well with web for at least some subset of planets around other stars. Okay, Eileen has a good question here. Um, and so with Webb looking at infrared, and then we've had other infrared uh, telescopes and uh, also ones that have been in ultraviolet. And so what, how does this fit in 
Um, I know that in the past there were the great observatories in space with uh, looking at these different wavelengths. And so are all the bands of the EM spectrum being covered and uh, along with Webb to kind of complement the whole spectral range? Yes. Um, so she was particularly yeah. interested in what's looking at x-rays these days. Yes. Um, so there are several different x-ray telescopes that are in space. Um, Chandra, for example, um, uh, and I'm blanking on the other ones. <laughs> Sorry, X-ray astronomers, I worked with you for years and now uh, you have exited my mind. But yes, there are several, um, Astrostat is another one. So there are like three or four, depending on how you count it, X-ray telescopes in the sky at the moment. There's a gamma ray telescope. Um, Hubble has really has the monopoly on UV light at the moment. There aren't any other UV telescopes after Galax um, kicked the bucket in like 2010-ish. Uh, um, and so that is really an area that people are a little concerned about. Hubble is getting on 30 years. It's good for now, but what if something happens to Hubble, we'll lose the ultraviolet. Um, and so there's a proposed mission from uh, Canada called Castor, which actually is just going into a, a new design phase, which I'm really excited about. And that is a Canadian led UV telescope. All right, David asked a question um, and I'm gonna apologize right now. We've got way more questions than what we have time for. Um, and so we're gonna do our best to try to you know, select some here. So David has a really nice question. How do we know the earliest galaxies detected by Webb are in fact the first galaxies? Isn't it possible that our earlier galaxies that we can't detect? I mean, I guess there could be. Um, so I, when, we, so there's a big question mark on that area of the, that time of the universe. Um, and so we have some ideas about what these first galaxies would look like, the first stars. And it also has to do with the amount of like boring neutral uh, hydrogen gas that's around. So once you start making stars and galaxies, you start ionizing this gas. So if the universe was um, ionized a lot earlier, than we thought it was, then maybe we aren't seeing the first galaxies. Um, we think we do based on the evidence that we have, but Webb could really open up this area of science. And that's sort of one thing that maybe I didn't talk about as much in the talk as I should have that like when Hubble launched, it had these science goals and the most interesting things to come out of Hubble have been the things we didn't even know about. And at, you know, in the early nineties when this uh, thing was brand new. So there's going to be some really exciting discoveries that surprise us that come out of web. We've had several questions about uh, the capability of service missions to web. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the downside. Not that we can service Hubble at the moment. We don't have a space shuttle. We don't have a robot thing can go up there. So really Hubble is on its own if something happens, which is a little scary. Um, you can't service web, it's too far out. We don't have any way to send astronauts, astronauts out to fix it, which is part of why it's been tested so much while it's on the ground. And that's part of why it's been delayed is really web cannot fail. So they have to run through all of these tests to make sure it will be perfect the first time. And when it runs out of fuel, which um, is at least five years, we're gonna try to push to 10 and maybe if we're, extra special clever, we can extend that a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, once we run out of fuel and the telescope can no longer keep itself at L2, then we'll have to say goodbye to Webb and that will be really sad. Okay, David asked a question. Uh, when photons travel long distance through space, they redden and lose energy. Where does the lost energy go? Um, <laughs> so, the the I guess the um, the expansion of space doesn't conserve energy. Um, so the I guess that is a good question to ask a cosmologist. And as a poor lowly astronomer who studied stars, 
I'm not quite sure of the answer, but it's a good question. Maybe someone in the chat can Google that for me. <laughs> okay, we've also had a couple of uh, questions about the, the gyros and reaction wheels uh, for station keeping and orienting. Uh, how reliable are they? And they note that uh, several have not, you know, they're down to only like one or two on the Hubble and it's a concern. So. Yes, it is a concern on Hubble. And that's sort of their, the people who control Hubble, those are their precious babies. And they're really, when the gyros go on Hubble, that's when it goes. So they are, they really baby those guys. And I think they figured out how to run it on one gyro, um, which was not the case when it, it launched. Um, the gyros in web, from what I understand, are like orders of magnitude more reliable, like they don't fail. Um, the, the way that they're constructed is different than the ones that are used on Hubble. And so there's really not a concern that they're going to fail in the lifetime of the mission. The lifetime of the mission is really determined by the amount of fuel in the telescope. Okay, so I think we've got, uh, let's do two more questions. We wanna be considerate since you're on East Coast time. Um, so this is the next to last question, and we've actually had several uh, related to this as far as uh, searching for objects within the solar system or in the Kuiper belt or in the Oort cloud that are warmer. And so will Webb be able to find some of these nearer objects and not just the very cosmically distant objects? Yes, yes. That's another thing that um, Webb will be really good at is... Um, observing, yes, uh, small bodies within the solar system like Kuiper belt objects that um, are just the right temperatures to glow in infrared light. Um, and Webb is um, above the atmosphere and it can stare at things for longer periods of time. So if you wanna say, go search for planet nine, um, you might be able to, to use the web telescope or even um, use the, the data that's already coming from the web telescope for other purposes to look for Kuiper belt objects that are annoying for some astronomers and exciting for other ones. All right, so we'll go for the uh, last question. And so you know, and I'm gonna combine a couple of things here. And so it has to do with the life expectancy of web and what sorts of um, surprises do you think we might, you know, considering that it's going to hopefully be many, many years. And so within however many years that is, what kind of surprises do you think might turn up? Oh, gosh. I mean, um, yeah. So the lifetime of Webb, as I was talking about, is somewhere between five to 10 years. Hopefully on the 10 year side, maybe it'll surprise us go longer. I hope so. Um, we spent a lot of effort to get it up there. Um, I mean, it's kind of hard to predict like a surprise in the future. I think well, exoplanets have always surprised us about how weird they are. I think we'll learn a lot about the atmospheres of exoplanets and how different or similar they are to each other. There's also, we don't know a lot about the era of the first galaxies. So basically any questions that we answer will be, a surprise to us, we'll be able to find out a lot more about the history of galaxies and the mergers of galaxies and, and that sort of thing. It's, um, yeah, I'm excited to, like to with, find with out. With Hubble, one of Hubble's prime missions was to refine the Hubble constant. And then it mm -hmm. ended up uh, in doing that, had returned a whole lot of data that indicates that the universe is not only expanding, but it's accelerating. And so that was, a, a, I yeah. think, a huge surprise that no one anticipated for that. Exactly. And if you would ask me, like 1990s me, I mean, I was a wee little thing, but, you know, the equivalent of me in the 90s, like what Hubble would discover, no one would have said that, right? All right. Well, that's all for tonight. Thank you very much, Kelly, for joining us this evening. It was an enlightening talk. We had a fantastic questions. I think we set a record with the number of questions answered with 21. Uh, we've never had that many questions answered before. And so I apologize for the other 30 questions that uh, we didn't quite get to. Uh, but thank you again, Kelly, for joining us this evening. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and we look forward to 
seeing you all next month. And so you'll be able to find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities. We will post tonight's presentation on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel uh, pretty much right away. And tomorrow it will show up on the NSN website. Join us for our next webinar on Thursday, April 29th, when we bring you a special edition uh, of the webinar featuring Astronomy Magazine Editor-in-Chief David Eicher and guests from several citizen science projects. Be sure to join us for this conversation. So keep looking up and we will see all of you next month. So good night, everyone. And so good night, everyone. I'm so glad that so many of you from all over the country were able to join us. Oh, we had a great, great crowd. I don't know how many were on YouTube. And, and so, you know, I, I will for sure um, look at the attendance report